I was just about to say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love um, how God works because uh, uh, Uncle Randy, or Papaw, um, always has a way of, uh, he never tells me what he's going to share on Sunday nights, and he never really asks what I'm going to be preaching on during the week, but he almost always perfectly sets up uh, the messages for the week, and I know that's God at work. But as we think about being citizens of heaven, right, what enables us, what empowers us to live as citizens of heaven, even though we're still on earth? Anybody got a, a guess to what my answer is to that question? Grace. Grace. All right. Because grace doesn't just save us, but it brings heaven to us. And last week we talked about grace. This week we're talking about grace. And as we think about grace this morning, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever made an exchange? All right, a trade, if you will. All right, we're, we're really familiar with the idea of an exchange. If you've ever bought something, you've made a purchase, you've made an exchange, right? Isn't it great? You can, you can go somewhere and, and you take their things and you give them a few little pieces of paper or a plastic card, right? And you make what? An exchange, all right? And so usually we try to make exchanges that we think are either advantageous for us or for someone else. Maybe you've done the Christmas gift exchange thing, right? All right, where we exchange gifts and we try to, to make it equal. We try to make it fair. Well, as we think about grace, I want you to think about grace in terms of an exchange. Because until you understand the exchange that grace makes in our life, you'll never really have a grip on what God's grace is all about. And you'll never understand the enormity of God's kindness and love towards you. Now... In order for us to truly understand the exchange that grace makes, we have to look at ourselves first. And we have to look at our sin. And looking at our sin and our sinfulness is not always the most pleasant or comfortable thing to do. It may not be what you want to do on a Monday morning. But in order to understand how glorious God's grace is, and understand the exchange that He's made, we need to understand sin. And it's such a familiar little word, isn't it? But in our culture today, we've done a really great job of taking that little word and sort of minimizing it. Because it's not really in style anymore to talk about sin. It's too rigid. It's too, well... We would call the big stuff sin, right? Like the, the, you, because you wouldn't know how we categorize our big sins and our little sins, right? You ever done that? So things like murder, you know, we're pretty sure that's a sin. And if somebody steals something from you, that's definitely a sin, right? Or if somebody mistreats you, that's, that's probably definitely a sin. But there's other things that we would say, well, that's just a mistake, a choice. I'm just living with the times. That part of God's law isn't for today. We have excuses for our sin too, don't we? Poorly raised by my parents, my friends. Maybe I was improperly potty trained, right? <laughs> it's actually been offered as an excuse. We like to think that in reality we're not all that bad. And that compared to others... We're actually quite good. Have you ever felt that way? If you're just honest, you ever say, you ever really just thought, compared to other people, I'm, I'm really a pretty good person. Right? And we talk about so-and-so being a good person. But in order to understand grace, we need to understand sin. And we need to understand that sin is something more than we just do or don't do. I think a lot of times our, our understanding of sin and sinfulness is just, sin is, is this rule and I broke this rule. Or sin is I was supposed to do this and I didn't do this. Right? And we think about sin as being something I do or I don't do. But sin is more than that. Sin is ultimately an act of rebellion against God. Sin is an act of rebellion against God. When Adam and Eve chose to sin, they chose to be rebels. They chose to rebel against God. And ever since then, their offspring have been born with rebel hearts. We are all by nature rebels. We're all by nature people who are seeking a kingdom where we are king. Because really that's the essence of sin. It's saying, God, I want to be in charge. I want to have the rule and authority over my life. 
And so we live in rebellion. I want you to imagine this. Imagine you and your family decided to go on a vacation. And you decided to go on a really long vacation, maybe for a month or two months. Think about your favorite place. Where would you like to go on vacation? Well, you get to go there. And you entrust the care of your house to somebody to keep an eye on it, to keep the grass cut, to go in every now and then and make sure everything's okay. And you expect that they'll do that. But when you come home, you find out that they haven't just taken care of your house, they've moved in. And they've kicked all your stuff out and left it on the curb. And they've moved all their things in. And you come back and you say, but this is our house. This is where we live. And they're like, no, we live here now. How would you feel? Well, that's exactly what sin is. Sin is rebellion. Sin is saying, God, I don't want you or your ways. I want my ways. And here's the thing. We're all sinners. Isaiah says it like this. He says, we all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. See, in order to understand grace, you need to understand yourself. And in order to understand yourself, you need to see what God says about you and your sin. Sin is not a mistake. It's not a lack of judgment. It's not an occasional stumble. Sin is demanding authority in your life. Sin is rebellion against God, and we are all rebels. Paul puts it this way, Romans chapter 3. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous. Right, because we talk about good people, right? Or I'm a good person, or so-and-so is a good person. But apart from Christ, he says, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, there's no one who seeks God. For who has turned away from God? All. All have turned away. They have together become worthless and there is no one who does good, not even one. Do you sense a reoccurring theme in those verses? Four times he says no one. Two times he says not even one. And one time he says all and together. So there's a theme here. Anytime we see that sort of repetition in scripture, it should get our attention. He says there's no one righteous, there's no one good. Everyone has sinned. We don't like to think about ourselves in those terms, but if you're going to understand how radical God's grace is, if you're going to get a grip on the exchange that grace makes, we need to understand this truth. Apart from Christ, we are not good. Now, we might be good if we measure ourselves in comparison to others. I'm sure compared to a lot of other people, you are or would appear to be good. And maybe I would too. But if we measure according to God's standard, none of us measure up. None of us meet God's standard. None of us have achieved the standard that He requires, which is perfection. Per per perfection, sinlessness. When we measure by His standard, none of us measure up. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, chose this word to describe himself. Now, I'm sure if I had asked you this morning to, to describe yourself in one word, you probably wouldn't have picked that word, would you? you? You may have come up with something like amazing or talented or beautiful or perfect. <laughs> right? But wretch. John Newton said, I apart from Christ, I'm a wretch. It's not a word we use a lot. It means despised or despicable. And you see, John Newton came to a place where he realized that apart from Christ, that's who he was. If there ever was a wretch, it was a man named Barabbas. And for just a few moments this morning, I want us to think about Barabbas because Barabbas and Jesus provide the ultimate contrast. And their lives intersected one day in a way that no one could have imagined. And if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 27 is where is one of the accounts of, of, of this. And we're gonna sort of I'm gonna just sort of highlight some of the things from that chapter for the sake of time. But just have your Bible open there so that you can look at it and reference these things. But I want us to, to consider this because if we're going to understand the exchange that grace makes, we need to understand Barabbas 
in his interaction with Jesus. So Matthew chapter 27. And if there was ever, ever somebody who was a wretch, it was probably Barabbas. We know that, that Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He was a rebel. He was somebody who wanted to overthrow the Roman government. And he was part of a group that was bent on overthrowing the government through violence. And so Barabbas is a violent man. He's a rebel. He's a murderer. And he has been caught, accused, condemned to die. And he is waiting execution in a, in a prison cell in Jerusalem. He was nothing like Jesus. And it's very interesting that in the oldest manuscripts, some of them, that his name is actually recorded as being called Jesus Barabbas. Barabbas just simply means son of my father. And so it's very possible that his name was Jesus Barabbas. Jesus was a common name in this time. And so think about this contrast between Jesus Barabbas and Jesus of Nazareth. Let's just look at, at the story real quickly. Look at verse 15. This is now the feast the governor was accustomed to release the crowd. That's the feast of Passover. To release to the crowd any one prisoner who they wanted. And they had a notorious prisoner. He was well known. And his name was Barabbas. So they got, when they gathered, Pilate asked them, Who do you want me to release to you? Barabbas? Jesus Barabbas? Or Jesus who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. And besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife had sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. And the governor said to them, Which of the two of you do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they shouted, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. You see, that day, there were two people that stood in absolute contrast to each other. Barabbas, a well-known and notorious sinner. Everybody knew about Barabbas' sin. It wasn't a secret. And there was Jesus, the sinless and perfect Son of God. Barabbas had a cross waiting for him. And Barabbas deserved his cross. He earned it. And he was awaiting execution. There were three prisoners to be executed that day. The two thieves who probably were cohorts of Barabbas and Barabbas himself. The three of them were scheduled to die this day. And Barabbas is off being held in a cell somewhere probably, probably within earshot of where this scene takes place. And you can probably sort of imagine what's going on in Barabbas' heart and mind. I mean, he's a hardened criminal, but even hardened criminals feared the cross. Because the cross meant certain death, but it meant shame, it meant torture, it was the worst way to die. And Barabbas probably can't hear everything, but he can probably hear the crowd and he starts to hear his name being shouted and probably strokes his ego a little bit and he gets excited until he hears the crowd yelling, crucify him. And I'm sure in Barabbas' heart and mind he knew what was about to happen. And he hears the footsteps come down the hallway. He hears the, the, the door being opened to his cell and he hears the guards yell, Come on, Barabbas. And he knows what's about to happen. He thinks he knows what's about to happen. But what happens? They say, Barabbas, get out of here. You've been set free. And on Barabbas' cross, Jesus is crucified. Even Pilate, who had no love or affection for Jesus, recognized that Jesus was innocent. And the innocent, the guiltless, took Barabbas' place. Think about Barabbas. Barabbas was dead. He was as good as dead as he waited for his execution. He was doomed to the shame and the suffering of the cross. And he was getting what he deserved. And what I want you to understand, even though you and I would probably not identify naturally with Barabbas, I want you to understand that he represents you and me more than we will ever know or understand. Because you and I are dead in our sins and our trespasses. The wages of sin is what? Death. 
You and I are dead apart from Christ. We're not, we're not people who need cleaning up or fixing. We're dead people who need life. We're doomed. We deserve the judgment that awaits us. It's well deserved. The wages of sin is death. It's what you earned for your sin. And just as Barabbas got an incredible pardon that day, God offers you and I an incredible pardon. An exchange. Look at what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says. It says, God made him who had no sin. And even Pilate recognized this. He says, There's no, I can't find any guilt in this man. Jesus was sinless. He lived the life that you and I can never, ever live. Jesus lived the life of perfection. He was sinless. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the exchange that grace makes. That's the exchange that grace makes. And in order for you and I to understand grace, to understand the cross, we need to understand our sin and ourself. We need to understand Romans 3.23. I know most of you know this verse. For all have sinned and all fall short of God's glorious way. Just like Isaiah had prophesied years before. We've all gone our own way. Every single one of us. But look at what the next verses say. Romans 3.24 and 25. Yet now God, in His gracious kindness, declares us not guilty. Let that soak in this morning. You are guilty in your sin. But in Christ, because Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for you. Because he absorbed the Father's wrath on your behalf. Because he died in your place. It says, now God in his gracious kindness declares you not guilty. He has done this through Christ Jesus, who has freed us by taking away our sin. For God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. In the counselor meeting the other day, we were talking about this word propitiation. How many of you ever heard that word? All right, a lot of you. It's not a word we use all the time. It's not a word we understand, but that's exactly what that is talking about there. It's the satisfaction of wrath. And so Jesus absorbed the Father's wrath for our sin. He satisfied God's anger because God is holy and just. He doesn't overlook sin or excuse sin. And he says we are made right with God. We are given right standing, righteousness with God when we believe, when we place our faith in the fact that Jesus shed his blood sacrificing his life for us. For God was being entirely fair and just when he did not punish those who sinned in former times. Because those who sinned in former times who had faith in God were also justified by Jesus' death for sin. You see, God doesn't overlook sin. He doesn't excuse sin. He doesn't sweep sin under the rug. But here's what he offers an exchange. He offers you and I in exchange. He says, you are a sinner, you are a rebel, you are an insurrectionist, and you have earned death. You have broken my laws, you've broken my commandments, you've rebelled against me, and as such you are doomed, you are dead, and it's well deserved. But I offer you in exchange. In exchange for being dead, I would like to make you alive. In exchange for being doomed, I want to give you a glorious future. God offers a glorious future and gracious exchange. And a glorious and gracious, His life for yours. Because you were the one who deserved to die. You were Barabbas. You were the one who had earned death. And Jesus died in your place as your substitute. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. <coughs> It says, for Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus was righteous and you and I weren't, but he suffered anyway for us. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. We'll never know for sure how Barabbas responded to the grace that he received that day. Tradition holds that he watched Jesus die that afternoon. Don't know what it was like for him to stand there and watch the sinless Son of God die on the cross that he deserved, the one that was erected for him. But put yourself there today. Picture that scene. Because that was your cross and my cross. 
That was what I deserved. It's what you deserve. And Jesus took the cross for you. He absorbed the Father's wrath on your behalf. We don't know how Barabbas responded. And we're not responsible for his response. But here's the thing. You are responsible for your response to the cross. And to God's offer to the exchange for your sin. And here's the thing. As long as the cross is about Jesus dying for the world, grace will never, ever, ever transform you. It might touch you. It might impact you. It might influence you. But it will never transform you. As long as Jesus is God's gift to the world, grace will touch you, but not change you. So personalize it. For you. Think about that. He died for your sin. He died for your guilt. He took your shame, your punishment. He absorbed the wrath of God on your behalf. And he calls out to you and says, I would like to offer you an exchange. You're dead. You're doomed. And I would like to exchange that for life and grace and heaven. Here, now. Be a citizen of heaven here on this earth and one day in my kingdom forever. And so God calls out and says, would you like this exchange? And he offers us this exchange. Instead of shame and guilt and pain, he says, I offer you peace and joy and life. And so he calls us to respond to his grace. Here's the thing. If you've never responded to God's grace, he offers you an opportunity today. To say, I realize that I am a sinner. And if I just be honest and stop trying to make myself look better and compare myself to others, in God's standards, I fall short. You fall short. We all fall short. But Jesus lived the life that you could never live. He died the death that you deserve to die. He rose from the dead. He conquered death. And he offers to you an exchange. And if you've never accepted that, the way you do that is by faith, by believing. By telling God, I do believe. I want that exchange. I want you. See, because salvation and grace isn't just about getting a ticket to heaven. It's about a relationship with God. It's about getting God. God just doesn't give you heaven. He gives you himself. And he makes you a citizen of heaven here and for eternity. And here's the thing. We should never, ever, ever get over this exchange. Because there's something I've noticed in walking with Christ for many years. Sometimes we forget how glorious the exchange was and is. And sometimes we get to a place where we think, I really sort of deserve this relationship that I have with God. But we should never, ever get over it. Because it's that thing, it's understanding this exchange that causes me to realize, here's why I want to obey God. Here's why I want to follow God. Here's what I, why I want to live for Him. Here's why I want to follow Him. Because He exchanged His life for mine. And he took what I deserved, which was death, and he absorbed it in my behalf. And he's given me life. And so the reason that I want to love him, the reason I want to serve him and live for him, the reason that I want to trust him and obey him and follow him is because of this incredible and glorious exchange that God offers me, and he offers you, and he offers everyone. And we should never, ever, ever get over that. Grace is an invitation to exchange your sin and your shame and your guilt for the righteousness of Christ. To know him and to live for him. We've been talking about this verse a lot. It came up at the bonfire. We've talked about it last week. But it really makes sense when you understand the exchange of grace, right? I've been crucified with Christ. It was me that deserved death. It was me for whom Christ died. And so Paul says, I've identified my life with Jesus' death. And therefore, it's no longer I who live. It's not about me anymore. I've been redeemed. I've had an exchange take place. The God of the universe has come to live in me. He says, Christ lives in me. And now the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. Who loved me. He loves you. That's the whole basis for this exchange is the love of God. The whole basis, the whole reason why Jesus absorbed the Father's wrath on your behalf, the whole reason that the Father allowed His Son to bear your sin was because of His incredible love for you. And out of that incredible love for you and in this glorious exchange that grace makes, God calls us to respond and to live a life that reflects the reality that our sin and our shame and our past has been exchanged for God's righteousness and His grace, and His mercy, and His love. And He calls us to live differently. Not because we have to, but because we can. 
and because we want to, because we understand the depth of his grace. We understand what we were apart from Christ. And never forget who you are apart from Christ and what you were. Don't go back and wallow in your sin. Don't go back and wallow in your shame. But remember what Christ did. Remember where you would be without him. And then live a life that reflects the reality that you are now a citizen of heaven. And grace is filling your life and changing the way that you live. Would you bow your heads this morning? I just want to, to pray for you. But before we pray, I, I just want you to take just a moment to just think and reflect on this exchange that grace makes. And I just want you in your mind and your heart, I, I believe with all my heart that God gave us imagination so that we could use it to know Him and experience Him. And I just want you to imagine the scene, that cross, where Jesus died. And picture Barabbas there watching. Picture and think what may have been running through his mind. What would have ran through your mind? And then I want you to realize this morning that it was for you. For you that he was there. Your sin was there. Your shame was there. Your guilt was there. And Jesus has borne your shame. And he's borne your guilt. And he did it because he loves you. He chose to be there. I want you to rest in that love and that grace. And then I want you to think about what it means. Jesus offers you an exchange. Have you ever made that exchange? And if you have, are you living like it? Part of that exchange is that God comes to live in you. And your life now belongs to Him. And it's a glorious exchange. Live out the reality of that grace. Father, I just pray for each person here this morning. Father, I thank you for the privilege of, of all of us being able to be here together this week. Father, you've brought us here from several states and countries. You've brought us here from all kinds of backgrounds and places. But Father, there's one thing that, that unites all of us, and that's your love for us and our need to experience your grace. And so, Father, I just pray that each of us this morning would understand how glorious of an exchange that you offer us through grace. And Father, I pray that, that understanding who we were apart from Christ and understanding the weight of our sin and the result and the consequences of our sin and then realizing that you've set us free and you've exchanged our sin for your righteousness. Father, I pray that that would motivate us to live for your glory, to live as citizens of heaven, to live for you and your kingdom. And Father, I pray that you would get much glory from it. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.